Uh, welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Uh, this week, we're going to look at a radical feminist perspective on Virginia Woolf's Three Guineas, and uh, it's going to be discussed by Sue Gittins and Joe Brew. Um, uh, do put your comments in the chat, and it could be that you have more radical perspective, <laughs> feminist perspectives um, on this. Um, so that would be really helpful and do do go ahead with that. Oh no, I need to check that. Okay. So um, I'm going to hand over to Sue, who's going to give you her um, the introduction <clears throat> to um, Virginia Woolf's Three Guineas. Oh, well, and in fact, I'll go back to this slide. Okay, over to you, Sue. Thanks, Joe. This is a great privilege to be able to talk about Three Guineas. Um, it's a brilliant polemic and uh, an extended essay about patriarchal culture, about patriarchal oppression. And it's very witty and funny and cheering. Um, can we have the first slide from the, yeah. So this is the, just the opening paragraph to set it in context. Um, three years is a long time to leave a letter unanswered. And your letter has been lying without an answer even longer than that. I had hoped that it would answer itself or that other people would answer it for me. But there it is with its question. How, in your opinion, opinion are we to prevent war? Still unanswered. So when you think that this was written in 1938, the year of the Munich Agreement of Peace in Our Time, both of which agreements were broken and war was definitely, definitely impending. So the ruling classes were really wondering what to do with this menace of the Third Reich. Um, obviously it's pertinent at the time. Right, so um, that gives us a bit of an introduction to, um, I'm failing to, oh, here we are. So um, in my opinion, the best radical feminist analysis of Three Guineas is by Mary Daly um, in Gynecology. And she, in 1978, and then in Pure Lust, her other, um, well, one of her other books, 1984. And Mary Daly wrote, my charting and describing are inspired by one four sister, Virginia Woolf, who in her profoundly anti-patriarchal book, Three Guineas, asks, what are these ceremonies and why should we take part in them? What are these professions and why should we make money out of them? Where, in short, is it leading us the procession of the sons of educated men? And you can see on the bottom of the screen, these are the five photos that Virginia Woolf dotted throughout the text of Three Guineas. They were taken from newspapers that she found at the time, and they show the processions of the sons of educated men. Now, um, apart from Mary Daly's very radical feminist analysis, uh, a lot has been written about Three Guineas. And there's one very good feminist introduction in the 1993 Penguin Classics edition of Three Guineas by the Marxist feminist Michelle Barrett. Now, when you if you read that, it's very good, but she's a Marxist feminist. She is not a radical feminist. So she does not take the perspective that radical feminists would take. And we're going to explain to you um, throughout this video and this, this webinar. Um, what's so radical feminist about Three Guineas? What, are the, what do we see in it that Michelle Barrett, the Marxist feminist academic, uh, did not see and does not speak about? Um, another sort of really good uh, uh, analysis or is uh, 19, oh, 20, 2019 uh, Super Summary narrated by Molly Gallegos, uh, which is an audible uh, book, and it's um, 
it's very, very close to, I mean, a lot of very, very radical fem feminist uh, ideas in there. Uh, so that's actually a really great way if you want to get to grips with the book and you like listening to Audible. Um, so that's it. So just to, and then to say what Three Again is in, is it's a feminist essay. <clears throat> it's the second of Virginia Woolf's feminist essays. A Room of One's Own was written in 1929 um, beforehand. So 10 years before this. Um, it's a polemic. So it's an argument uh, on the interconnectedness of patriarchy and war. So in that way, you would say it's theory. It's not just a list of famous women or uh, a historical sort of uh, discussion of what's happening in the day. It's uh, an argument based on evidence and logic and her insights. It's in the form of three letters, considering how best women could promote peace. And Wolf replies to an imaginary correspondent who's asked her for, hit, for advice on how to prevent war in which she considers donating a guinea, so that's the old fashioned uh, form of British pound. Um, and it was old fashioned in her day as well. She considers donating to women's education, so women in the universities, women's access to professions like being a lawyer or a doctor, um, uh, and or, or even in the church, um, and uh, whether she would donate her guinea to an anti-war organisation. Um, the letters form an argument. It's carefully constructed with logic and a lot of evidence. And she wrote in her diary that she was very keen to write uh, Three Guineas. She was ready to it. And she said, I have collected enough material to blow up St Paul's which is, and there are incredible numbers of footnotes in the book. So there's, I think there's 50 pages of footnotes of this incredible evidence that she's collected. Okay, over to you, Sue. So this is um, an example, this quotation, this extract of the wit and um, the, the kind of deathly wit that she uses to puncture this pomposity of the processions, the educated men, the ruling classes, in other words, the men in frocks of her time. Um, and it's a chilling, isn't it, a chilling echo of, of our time, because we're still talking about men in frocks. So she, shall I read the whole thing, Joe? No, no, just t tell us why you picked it. Yeah. So I picked it to show how witty she is. And it ends up, it's a description of the kinds of um, dress and decoration that men wear um, in order to create the spectacle of being able to be ruling classes. And it ends with this little remark that kind of just punctuates the whole thing. A woman who advertised her motherhood by a tuft of horsehair on the left shoulder would scarcely, you will agree, be a venerable object. In other words, all of this pomposity is empty show and doesn't actually show any virtue or any authority or any right at all to, to be the ruling class. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would disagree. I think, I think she's saying they're showing that they have the, the, the rule. I mean, she's, she's trying to ridicule it, but um, the reality is they, they, they use these clothes uh, to show their power and status. So I just, I, I, I would say um, when you saw those, when you see these pictures, you think, yeah, they're in charge. But mm. you're, you're, I mean, it, she's showing the difference between men and women. Mm. Okay, so um, with the next slide. Um, so why is Three Guineas a radical feminist text? Um, one, women are a sex class. In Three Guineas, um, Virginia Woolf says women are a sex class. She uses the words uh, sex class and she demonstrates it, and we're going to show that in this uh, this uh, PowerPoint. Or sort of. Secondly, she says patriarchy is the root um, of the problems. So you can't stop war without stopping patriarchy. So in her response to this fictional uh, letter writer, this man writing to her saying, can you help us stop war? How, how would you do it? Um, she Her answer is, you there's no point trying to stop war if you don't stop patriarchy. And that's a radical, well, the, the fact that patriarchy is at the root of 
uh, the problems is a radical feminist, feminist insight. Next, she said that the system is based on patriarchal male dictatorship over females who are essentially slaves in the family, the private sphere, and male control of anti-women professions in the public sphere. So she talks very explicitly about women being controlled by the family and by men in the family, and it uh, sort of it basically essentially slaves. She says she calls them essentially slaves. <clears throat> and then that uh, until 1919, women didn't have access to the professions, which she sort of highlights and explains. Um, but uh, the male control of the private, the public sphere sort of continues the patriarchy um, in the whole of society. Next, uh, Wolf wants to end patriarchy and create something new, not join as equals. So that would be a sort of liberal feminist um, type of idea that we could just join up if if we join the professions um and then that will be fine that's a sort of liberal idea so she doesn't want that she wants to just completely overthrow the patriarchy and, and be creative so criticize it and create a, a new form of humans living differently that's radical feminist as well she's abolitionist so she warns against prostitution of the body and also the mind. Now she doesn't go very explicitly into the problems with prostitution, but they were really well documented up all through the 19th century and uh, up until her time. And she was very aware of the campaigns warning, the feminist campaigns against prostitution of the body. But she adds uh, very explicitly, a warning about prostituting your mind is very interesting about uh, doing things that uh, are true to you and also true to our vision of a better society rather than just selling our minds um, uh, to prop up the patriarchy. Um, she suggests that we should set up women-only political institutions and she talks about this you know, very famously, the Society of Outsiders. Most of, a lot of the third part of the book, the third letter in the book, talks about what the society of outsiders she envisages is and as you read it we'll, we'll say you you realize that this is very close to radical feminist ideas of how to organize so she has she articulates a lot of very interesting ideas in that third part of the book and the last way i i would suggest that it's radical feminist is she has her solution is that we can't with, we can't completely withdraw from society and we can't, uh, we need to be in it. And so she doesn't talk about boundary living. That's a term that Mary Daly uses, but she does conclude that we should be within the system. We should try to join the professions and change them, criticize and, and be creative. So we change the professions, but also be outside the system in our society of outsiders um, so to have those two things, and that links up very closely to what Mary Daly then talked about in terms of boundary living and be being inside and outside. I, I would say that's radical feminist. Um, uh, and, and another thing that I haven't, that we haven't written here, but just to sort of mention is that right at the core of the book, she says, well, what can we do? We've got so little power. Uh, we the daughters of educated men which will explain her why she uses that term uh, in a minute but she says we should think about the processions we should just sit there and look at the processions of the professionals and from many of us and think about what it is and guess what's going on and that's quite a radical feminist tradition is that we criticize the patriarchal structures and sometimes use guesswork to sort of have insight into what's going on okay so next one over to you again sue okay just wanted to say thanks for the chat there's some interesting points being made in the chat and very entertaining and also in terms of the processions a playwright called laura wade um i think in about 20, 20 2009 wrote a play called posh and it was based on the bullying and the oxford bullying club um which is uh, a really good example of observing exactly what these processions of men in their costumes do. 
it, it charts and nights in Oxfordshire, where the posh club, the posh club, which is based on the Bullington Club, go and they basically trash a whole room in a in a pub and they nearly kill the publican. Um, and there's a sum of £29,000, I think, offered to the publican's daughter for having sex with a group of them. And it's basically a study in total degeneracy. Um, the film that was made from Posh is not as good. It's called The Riot Club. But I think it's worth a watch if you're interested in, in this kind of study that Virginia Woolf recommends. Yeah, and I would I would just add to that that one of the reasons it's great to read as a book today is that as you read it, just like Sue's just made a connection with the um, the the uh, men's societies who the men who rule our societies today. Um, there are so many connections that get sparked by reading it. Um, uh, it's a very sort of uh, it. It creates creativity. It lets you, it, it it asks you questions, and it um it makes you think of lots of other connections, which is a fantastic experience. You know, it's not just Virginia Woolf telling us her ideas. As you read it, it you end up thinking a lot. So that's that's what Sue's just illustrated. Yeah, it's it's immensely inspiring, and it's almost the voice of my life. In fact, this this essay, look at the money, look at the difference in resource actually examine that and contemplate it. She says here, um, peace, 42,000 pounds a year, was the, or was the total income of the Women's Social and Political Union. And then she contrasts that with 300 million spent annually upon arms. So we have yeah. to contemplate that. Yeah, and I mean, this, we, we haven't uh, written uh, down about this. We, we can explain here about why she, uses the term the daughters of educated men. She, Virginia Woolf explains this in her first chapter. She says, um, we, are not a set, we are not a class with our brothers and fathers and sons uh, because of the massive disparity in education. We don't get educated. And she talks about this Arthur's Education Fund where, and she explains, it goes on for a few pages, it's really clear that middle-class families uh, saved up all their money or not much money to educate Arthur, the son, and the daughters would uh, possibly have a little bit of education, maybe a tutor to teach them German that she's, or, or in one other language if they're lucky. But they, they're like Virginia Woolf, she didn't go to school, she didn't go to university, and she was educated at home by her parents who were bad at educating her. So she essentially educated herself, although of course she was in this very privileged position. But the reality is that um, the, it's not just the books, it's the meeting people, it's the lectures, it's the walking groups, it's the dinners. Uh, and she talks about that. And she says, so we're just not uh, in a sex class, in a class with middle class men. So she, instead of saying we are middle class women, she uses a completely different term, which is we are the daughters of educated men and then sets up those women as uh, well she's one of them uh, and that's the center of the argument now it's in she does mention working class women and she has a class analysis and she is against uh privilege and she's sort of like doesn't is, is conscious of class distinctions in the sort of economic sense but she says that um to really understand the situation of uh women um, you need to understand just how much they're not uh, allied with their brothers in their class. And that's, uh, we didn't, I didn't go on about that, but that makes her very much not a socialist feminist. She yeah. doesn't talk about the middle classes or the working classes, although she does talk about working class women at one stage, doesn't she? At least one stage. Okay, back to you, Sue. But she keeps following the money, and this is another absurd example. Absurd, tragic, awful the salaries of these um, luminaries of the established church, the 15,000, the 10,000, the dean gets 3,000, the deaconess gets 150 pounds. Uh, yeah, just, just yeah. a really good example. Of, yeah. of how concrete her examples is. 
are and also it's full of these kinds of examples which really inform the radical message they it really shows that women are a sex class and that this is this is the means by which we're kept as a sex class Oh, it, it also, I mean, this second quote, when prophecy was a voluntary, this is the church, the religious stuff, it was a voluntary unpaid occupation that, that men and women had equality with it when it was voluntary and unpaid. But when the church became a profession, uh, required special knowledge and was paid, one sex remained inside the church and the other was excluded. And that is a very important insight as well. It's, it's that women are able to participate with forms of equality when there isn't money around paying us for our expertise. But the moment things get professionalized and there is money around, um, then one sex remains inside the men and the other becomes excluded, which is incredibly pertinent to what's happening in things like the women's refuges, rape crisis centers, speaking on behalf of women, all of those actions that uh, were sort of voluntary that we set up now that there's money behind them there's a maneuvering to do exactly what she virginia wolf yeah. mentions before is that one sex gets the high salaries and is inside and and then the other sex is excluded and uh, um, i also noted although she doesn't mention this but it uh, shines a light on the situation in sports as soon as the sports became a professional rather than amateur participation, women were excluded. Oh, she does actually, she does something about football, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And how, how she, talk, she talks about how women, when they started getting paid, it was very popular. Uh, then they, they closed it down for women. Yeah. Um, I mean, just while we're on the stuff of class, <clears throat> she says at one stage, the daughters of educated men so are so disempowered by their confinement as semi-slaves in the family, lack of education, lack of access to uh, work and money and influence and power, et cetera, um, that if we, the daughters of educated men, went on strike, it, it would make very little difference. Uh, and we have very little power to influence whether there's gonna be a war or not. She said, but by contrast, Working class women, if they went on strike, this is 1938 or 39, actually might make a difference because they actually have some, would have an impact on, because they were the ones making the munitions. They were doing the actual work. And that's a sort of, so she's clearly aware of it. And she's say, she's she's not sort of pretending that there isn't those, that distinction. And she's saying actually, in some ways, you could argue that working class women had more power because of their relationship to the uh, the means of production or the the production of armaments. Mm. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So, yeah. next slide. Um, right. So this is this is the professions. Now, we're, I think we're probably blocking your view of that word, the processions. So these are the five pictures that Virginia Woolf shows in the text. So these are the universities and. Um, th th what she's showing here uh, are the, the images of the men, the sons of educated men, the, the professionals processing. So they're walking um, constantly over and over again, uh, wearing these robes, possibly dresses, uh, their most splendid clothes. Um, this is the universities. Now, this is the um, uh, this is a I think it's a general. It's called in the book. So uh, Virginia Woolf says there were great fighters. It seems the professional men in the age of Queen Victoria. There was the Battle of Westminster, the Battle of the Universities, the Battle of Whitehall. There was the Battle of Harley Street. There was the Battle of the Royal Academy. Um, now, as you read that, you suddenly realise, I mean, you might start off thinking they were fighters, they were fighting uh, wars abroad, and then you suddenly go, oh, these battles are battles for the bastion, bastions of patriarchal exclusion of women. Um, and it's, it's brilliantly written. Uh, the first couple of times I read this, I thought she's just talking about some wars abroad, mm. and then you sort of go, ooh, yeah, that, that's what she's telling us, that these professional men, whether they were fighting with guns, their 
one battle on the home front against the women uh, was were these battles of Harley Street. And she uses this, this military imagery to show that the professions are fighting against us. And then she says, it's true that the combatants did not inflict flesh wounds, chivalry forbade, but you will agree that a battle that wastes time is as deadly as a battle that wastes blood. Now, we know, well, one thing, uh, Virginia Woolf does not do in, in Three Guineas is she doesn't mention uh, explicitly, she does implicitly mention it, the violence against women in the household, on the streets, um, and the actual violence. So that's in a way something that she didn't do. And, you know, radical feminists, that's a key part of our work is to highlight actual violence, bodily violence against women. But she's she talks about one aspect of it so that's definitely something she didn't do there and just read this extra quote i'm going to move our pictures up to the top again um what connection is there between the sartorial splendors that means the sort of clothes that they're wearing the 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 special clothes of educated men and the photograph of ruined houses and dead bodies now the photograph that she's talking about is the spanish government in the Spanish Civil War, which was happening, kept sending every week uh, photos of dead bodies to, to tell people in Britain, but in other countries as well, what was going on in the Spanish Civil War. And she talks about this quite, saying that pi pictures go somewhere different into your consciousness. And she said that although women and men see the world differently, we often, she, she argues that we see pictures in a more similar, there's more, of a similar perspective because we just see it. And it's interesting that she, she uses photos and images of the professional men in their splendor to give a message. So anyway, so it says, obviously the connection between dress and war is not far to seek. Your finest clothes are those that you wear as soldiers. Yeah. Right, so we'll go on to the next one. So this those, is another... Those, those yeah. photographs from the Civil War did actually inspire a lot of heroic exodus from sort of middle class and, and working class, mostly men, to go to fight in the Civil War, didn't they? They were probably an infected form of propaganda. Yes, and then, uh, you know, uh, Virginia Woolf's nephew, Bell, was it Stephen Bell? Uh -huh. um, had went to the civil war and she they they she'd been against him going um and she knew him very well they spent lots of time together sort of the family and he died in the civil war in spain so yes. one of the, the so you know she would have been thinking about him as she thought about that you yeah. know a, a, about that that propaganda that got him to go and also thinking about you know well i suppose the whole issue of the the war so here we've got military music and the arts. This is the sartorial splendor of men in their processions. Uh, and the reason sort of pointed out about the music and arts is that she's very explicit as well that women are excluded from creating music and arts and that that cultural thing, one is important, but secondly is, um, is linked up, everything's linked, that the music you produce makes a difference to whether we're gonna have war, the arts make a difference to having war. She does say that uh, women have ma had managed and ha have managed to write more than any other, um, in, in any other area. And that mm. was because of the cheapness of the tools for writing. Mm. Okay, so here's the judiciary. Uh, processing in their dresses or frocks and um, and then here the church and she uses these photos they're sort of very very impressive at showing the connections and what's seeing behind and under um, the sort of normal things that people see and we still see pretty much most of this in our society but they were they were very present and she's sort of seeing telling us uh, what they mean in terms of patriarchy, um, which is uh, very, very insightful. Okay, and then this is, this is all of them together. Um, 
these are all the photos so you can see the mass strengths of the 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 professional men um and i think the way she's constructed the essay makes you feel that she's saying these are the ones who are keeping it going it's not she doesn't attack the arist aristocrats she doesn't attack working class men she says these are the ones we should blame um and i don't think i think that that's actually her analysis she actually does think that but you know okay so back to you sue Oh yes, just this very poignant quote. I mean, one of one of her delights as a as a writer is that she can go from the very ironic, very humorous, very satirical tone to something much more dramatic. And she goes, the very word society sets tolling in memory the dismal bells of a harsh music. Shall not, shall not, shall not, you shall not learn, you shall not earn, you shall not own, you shall not. Um, so it's, it's got this, this very this lovely rep repetitive thing in it. That's all, that's all that I thought about that quotation. Um, our, exclude, our exclusion be, for being told, you shall not, you shall not join in. Yeah, and that links up to um, her prescription or prognosis later on uh, in the book. She describes society and then she says, what, what should we do about it? What is to be done? And the third chapter of the book is asking um, her to join an anti-war society. Yeah. And she unpicks that and says, but, you know, what is a society? Um, even just a small anti-war society, once you gather together people into a group that's an organisation or a society, um, it means something different to women than to than it does to men, mm -hmm. and she she keeps going on about sort of the different perspective, the, our different experience of looking at say these pictures, like say these pictures. If we see those um, women see those, and uh, we would have one understanding, and men might have a completely different well would have a different understanding so one of the things she says is why do they wear these clothes and it's partly to show their status and control but it's partly also she says to uh glamorize for young men uh those jobs and to get men to young men to join the army um so she's sort of really going into the, this idea of that we all have different perspectives and then she goes further into that with this society quote saying for us it's you shall not shall not shall not you shall not learn you shall not and you shall not own anything you're not allowed um, to wear the frocks we are, we're the only ones who are allowed to wear the frocks yeah in in public and she also says such was the society relationship of brother to sister for many centuries she she there's a bit in I think it's in the chapter three as well where she says at home sometimes brothers are uh helpful to their sisters and you would think that they have a common interest and so you have instances of brothers helping sisters and love between brothers and sisters so she doesn't say that word love mm. but um she um she says that once you get outside the home, these brothers suddenly change because they're in society and then they start to be the excluders of their sisters. And um, we haven't got a quote for this, but I'll just mention it, that there's a, a time when she describes how women had got to Cambridge University. She's talking about Cambridge and they had colleges set up and they were allowed to study for degrees. So that took ages, but they managed to do it sort of in the thirties. And then they started asking for, um, oh, they, they weren't allowed to actually get degrees. So they weren't allowed to put the BA or MA after their names like their brothers were. And then they applied to the mass bodies of the university rectors and sort of decision-making bodies. And they were denied it. And it wasn't just that they were denied it by the authorities. The students, the male students, went to Girton and Newnham and they uh, damaged 
the buildings. They actually rioted outside the buildings. She's really outraged by this, obviously. I mean, I like it's it's completely outrageous. The idea that these these are the yeah. brothers, uh, her brothers, or you know, it's it, that these are the sons of educated men. They weren't. It wasn't enough to stop women being allowed to have a qualification. They actually went and did physical violence to the buildings, and that's. I mean, it's very threatening. So she's showing that um, uh, we don't see society the same. You know, at all the same. Oh, okay. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so here's here's another one, Sue. Over to you again. Okay, this is the outsider statement of all. I think it's a, a brilliantly written piece again. Um, in which she says she's 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 going deep into the critique of patriotism the idea that this is our country our territory this use of our when actually it means what what the person means what the statement has at its core is there are some of us for whom we can own this territory but we will exclude most of you we will exclude you because it's our country it's not your country. So she says, no, it's not our country. In fact, as a woman, I have no country. As a woman, I want no country. As a woman, my country is the whole world. Yeah, and that's one of the most famous quotes about uh, from Virginia Woolf. Uh, right, so that, so, because it's a brilliant piece of writing. Yeah, I mean, um, I think also, um, uh, a bit I like in this is it says um, uh, that it says it says if you if you insist upon fighting to protect me in our country, let it be understood soberly and rationally between us that you are fighting to gratify a sex instinct which I cannot share, to procure benefits for which I have not shared and probably will not share, but to gratify my instincts or to or to protect either myself or my my country um she also she says that um she thinks that this we will not get security and there's a there's a so there's a moment i, I don't think it's in this quote but she says basically i don't trust that if we win this war i'm going to be safe in this country mm -hmm. and that's that's a sort of sort of allusion to the the pervasive violence against women, although she doesn't explicitly saying it say it. But I mean, saying they've treated me us as slaves is pretty clear. Yeah. I mean, she does prefigure coercive control, which is and gaslighting. She pre, she prefigures those terms that we now use as as a, a, a huge part of violence against women that we're controlled coercively rather than by direct um, physical violence. And we're gaslit, we're told things, and we're told that our perspective is wrong because it doesn't fit with the, the patriarchal perspective. So in fact, she 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 just is with her time. Yeah, and, and also a point Sue made when we were talking about this before is this is a form of internationalism saying, as a woman, my country is the whole world. So, I mean, there's so much there about the nation state what's the role of the nation state and uh should we support it when it's not uh it, you know it's really not upholding what we want mm -hmm. in a in society mm -hmm. and uh, so it's partly saying she doesn't agree it's our country but secondly saying that internationalism that feminism has found so important and that is su such a sort of core part of our feminism as radical yeah. feminists. Yeah, yeah. Okay, next one. So, um, right, so in this, uh, so we're moving a little bit into her saying why she thinks some of this is going on. And um, and she, she often talks about um, men and women or common men and women uh, are to be free, they must learn to speak freely. And we cannot leave the psychology of the sexes to, ch to the charge of specialists. There are two good reasons why we must try to analyze both our fear and your anger. First, because fear and anger prevent real freedom in the private house. And second, because such fear and anger may prevent real freedom in the public world. 
they may have a positive share in causing war. Um, and she's she it's in the third section of the book. She looks into the, with the motives driving men um, and calls it your anger. And um, and then she's talking about our fear, which is it, it, she's sort of moving towards explicitly talking about um, uh, violence, physical violence, but she's naming our fear, uh, women's fear of men and fear of their anger. So she's she's sort of moving towards that a bit. Yeah. And then there's the the quote that it, Sue, you you say what you about this? Yeah, yeah. This this interests me a lot as a psychologist because um, she was actually born. Uh, Virginia Woolf was born in 1882, in the exact same year. Melanie Klein was born. And Melanie Klein was a highly influential female psychoanalyst. She was called, she's called a post-Freudian, but let's forget that. Yes, Freud theorized a lot of psycho psychology and the internal life and the relational life of human beings. But she actually bore some amazing fruit in her, in her investigation. And she she particularly influenced looking at infant development, child development, and human development as a whole, and really bored down into what this really means. So it's very interesting that born in the same year, whether they had any physical contact, I've got no idea whether they, they met ever, but they were born in the same year, so they were parallel lives. So, she, so Melanie Klein, the great psychoanalyst, who understood and pioneered the understanding of infant psychology, um, they're, they're, they're working in, in parallel lives. And at the, towards the end of Three Guineas, Wolf uses the term infantile fixation, I think on three occasions, and she gives examples. I've chosen this one because it's Elizabeth Barrett Browning and she's famous, she's a great poet. And she was confined to the house by her father. This is domestic abuse, this is violence, this is slavery. Yeah, and I mean, it, she uses uh, quite a few different terms in the book, some of which we still sort of clearly use, like women being a sex class um, and the private and public sphere. Um, and then some that we as radical feminists don't necessarily use, like we don't use as radical feminists, the term infantile fixation to explain mm -hmm men's uh, uh, sort of dominance and oppression of women. But it is interesting that she was sort of looking around, trying to work out what explains it. Mm -hmm. She uses other terms that we don't necessarily use now. Like she used aroma. She says, why is it that um, women stay in the lower ranks of the civil service. And then she, she gives lots of evidence of them being sort of held down, even though they were allowed to work in the civil service. And the uh, prime minister said they were equally as competent and good as men, but they just didn't get uh, up into the top ranks. And she said, there's an aroma around the, the term miss and around our sex. And then she talks about it and she sort of chases it around saying, what is this aroma? Let's chase it. Let's try and work yeah, out what's yeah. going on. And then yeah. after a while, she's explained what she thinks. And then she goes, the cat is out of the bag and yeah. it's a Tom. And which is also, well, to me, that's that's pretty good because she's using words and descriptions and methods that she could use. And she cut, she's she's just trying to talk about things using this term her own she also uses the term atmosphere she says there's this atmosphere and and you can't really pin it down it's this something that is holding women back and that again we don't as radical feminists use that term now but we do use I mean, some of the other terms when if hopefully if you haven't read it yet you'll everybody will read it um, she uses, she at one stage says, it's just dominance, it's just dominance and control. So she uses quite a lot of the words that we would use and um, uh, as well. So, th so this is, and, and, and she's sort of investigating and thinking about things. Now, this, she met Freud, Freud stayed 
at her house maybe not it not it was it, she was because we know that uh virginia wolf was in the bloomsbury set mm -hmm. and so she was part of a uh intellectual uh writer creative artistic communities and they met loads and loads of the uh sort of thinkers or writers of the time yeah, she, yeah. she disagreed with freud so she was not a freudian but yeah. So that's that that's radical feminist to not be a Freudian. Yeah. She didn't agree with him, but she does use this term, um, sort of trying to pin down what she thinks yeah. is happening. Yeah. Okay, here's here's another bit. So I'll um I'll explain this bit and then go back go back to Sue. Um so she argues that women see the world differently to men or than men. Having been excluded from public power, women, she says, women are unlike men. Un they are a different sex. They have a different tradition, a different education, which lead to different values. So that seems to me to be quite radical feminist. She's saying we are a different sex and we've been treated differently. We've been constrained. We've been treated like slaves. Um, and that has led to us now having different values and she doesn't she so she's saying it's it's partly our experience but the the fact that we are a sex class is also important mm -hmm. and then she sort of moves into saying that there are possibly I mean she says possibly there are so she does sort of hint that she thinks there might be innate male uh, enjoyment of violence and this is from the beginning but she says there are three reasons which lead your sex that's the male sex to fight one war is a profession and then th she's using evidence from men it's a source of happiness and excitement so they're sort of quoting about how they feel really fulfilled and she quotes that and it's also an outlet for manly qualities without which men would deteriorate and that's a sort of she's talking about the construction of masculinity um, and that being to do with war. She does, it, she doesn't quite say it here, but she does sometimes say there's a sort of male instinct um, towards war, but she equally says that it's to do with the construction of, she doesn't use the terms construction of masculinity, but it's an outlet for manly qualities. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, let's move on to the next one then. Yeah, okay. Please, yeah. Go on, Sue. Do you want to add something? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to reply to Shirley in the chat. She's talking about infantile fixation. And I don't disagree with her um, interpretation of the term. But the way that I would see it was that infantile means at the stage of infancy, and fixation means stuck. So you're stuck on the idea of yourself and others at a certain stage of development. And um, it's interesting that Wolf uses this several times. Um, and I kind of agree with her that there's a certain undeveloped quality to the masculine psyche, let me say with the greatest restraint, um, that it has an infantile quality. In other words, men don't grow up. They um, Certain, certain conditions combine. So they, did, they don't have to grow up in the same way that women do. But there's a, a long and interesting discussion to be had around that. Um, I'm very interested in that. And it's not necessarily the only point in um, Three Guineas. But Shirley, thanks for your point. Um, the, one of the strands that, she, that Virginia Woolf develops is the idea of this outsider society and different kinds of organization which is very women's liberation, second wave, and very much kind of what we're engaged in at the moment with gender critical movement. Um, and she kind of outlines a template for a poor college. In other words, a college that's not, not based on patriarchal institutionalization. And she, and she sort of describes what it should be like. Um, and we'll dispense with the dictated, regimented official pageantry in which only one sex takes the active part. And we'll dispense with personal distinctions. We won't have medals, ribbons, badges, hoods, gowns. Oh, that's a pity. I like medals. I like badges. <laughs> Not allowed. Very bad. <laughs> Very bad. She suggests that when women get power in their profession, 
they should help all properly qualified people of whatever sex class or of color to enter your profession. Yeah, and I, I, I suppose I want to highlight that, that uh, throughout the text, when you read it, you see that she is very aware of sex, class and yeah. race. And she sometimes yeah. says colour. Um, what she says is that women, once we get power, we should try to get enough power that we can have influence and we can change the world. But then we want to be creative and create a new society which will do away with the uh, distinctions or the oppression based on sex, class, race. And um, she's often... Uh, misrepresented as an elitist uh, and she she did live uh, to some extent an elite life but she was uh, powerless compared to a lot she didn't have an education compared yeah. to her brothers yeah um, but she is very conscious and she's she says that our way forward is uh, to do away with these isms the sexism racism um, uh, like classism and um, so that's I think that's good to know that she does that. And then the poor college, she says that she thinks that it should be open to everyone. Um, and again, she 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 says the education she's dreaming of will be open to men and women and to everybody. And it won't just be elitist intellectually. It will be um, a college where everybody can learn. So you don't have to be sort of academic. It will be open for everybody to create and learn new things. So she has a really radical vision, which is fantastic, which I would say again, is part of our vision as radical feminists. I can't um, remember if you've got the slide, but there was one quotation about what sort of people teachers should be. They no, should be livers, no, be livers and, and they should be livers. They should be people that have lived. It's something about that your teaching is the, on the basis of your experience and not your supposed knowledge or accumulation of, of qualifications, something yeah. like that. Yeah, and then she said we should set up new organisations. So uh, we should not join men's organisations. So we're not socialist feminists. We wouldn't yeah. join uh, uh, the Labour Party and work with men. Now, so she says that once we have power, we should not discriminate against men. So that's, yeah. that's her, her vision, but for the moment, we need to set up uh, new organisations and not join their organisations. So she yeah. doesn't. She chooses not to join the anti-war society. That in the yeah. third letter, she says, "I'm going to give you a guinea, but I'm not joining your organisation." And that yeah. sort of reflects her life. That she was married to Leonard Wolf, and mm -hmm. he kept on urging her. Everybody kept on urging her to do loads of anti-war work in the anti-war societies, and apparently mm -hmm. she just didn't want to do it yeah. and he didn't really understand why but she articulates very clearly she she just didn't want to be involved in patriarchal organizations even the small ones even if they're anti-war because she yeah. thinks that it's there's no point being in an anti-war organization if it doesn't do, if we don't overthrow patriarchy it's not so radical yeah it's just not yeah. it's just a waste of your time you're yeah. going to be yeah. propping up the it, as her analysis but so she says she has lots of ideas for the Society of Outsiders. She says, let us examine three only. And then in, she explains it. The first is straightforward enough. And she says, speaking at a bazaar last week at the Plumstead Common Baptist Church, the mayoress of Woolwich said, I myself would not even do so as much as darn a sock to help the war. And um, so she sees that she sees that she says that the Society of Outsiders would not be organized. We wouldn't have subscriptions. We wouldn't have a hierarchy. We wouldn't have officers. It would essentially be uh, a secret society. She said it should be secret because it's too dangerous to be doing it openly. So she understands that and that it really is the the movement of women doing things knowing that they're doing radical things and the mayoress of Woolwich is not darning socks as her yeah. radical act it's so brilliant there's a bit later you've got to read it um she goes her her revolution well she doesn't say revolutionary but her act of not darning socks the other two things that she said there's evidence that the society of outsiders is happening she says 
at that time, there were women football players and they set up a new way of doing football where they didn't give themselves trophies and rewards when they won. So they played football for the joy of playing football rather than for these big trophies. And she saw that as radical or as part of the work of um, changing society to prevent patriarchy and prevent war. And the last one she, she said is there's been a, a marked uh, sort of, uh, it's not an active, it's a passive uh, form of uh, change or aiming for change, which is not going to church. And she said that there are loads of young women who are just not going to church. And that's actually quite a, a profound thing. And she was very delighted by it, but um, it's not, you don't have to even say anything. And I, it's true, she doesn't say, yeah, some of them are going to be forced to go to church. But she says that the, the, all these options that might be just not darning socks, and you don't even have to say you're not darning socks, just mm. end up not darning them, mm. or don't go to church is, is sort mm. of quite nice. And then it's very women's movement. Yeah. And then the, she says professionalism leads to men taking over. So don't join men's societies and have an attitude of indifference. Different. And she says, don't even bother saying you don't, don't even bother telling them that you uh, don't want to join their societies, just be indifferent. And, and that's a quite radical feminist. That's made me think of uh, Julia Long's take your eyes off the guys type. Yeah. Stuff. And others, I mean, I guess this the more famous. Following this, this, great, your own. Yeah. yeah. And, and then uh, do you want to talk, you talk about this, Sue, the new economics? Not particularly, because I'm not sure okay, I can. I'll, I'll explain it. So yeah. um, <laughs> what she said is that, yes, we about that. Should, uh, as feminists, we should press for a living wage in yeah. our, for ourselves. Oh, gosh, yes, now I know. Yeah. The, the sort of wages for housework, I sort of thought of it. Yes, yeah, yeah. And that we, we should press for money for the unpaid workers. So this is yeah. absolutely going right into the territory of feminist economics, Marilyn Waring, if women, women counted, yeah, and then yeah. also the sort of wages for housework, who were not particularly yeah. radical feminists. But yeah, so I don't know whether we would say this is radical feminist, but we would say it's radical feminist to, to think of ways that society, I mean, maybe, I don't think there's a dis, decision on whether we think women should be paid or not no. doing this work, but how should society organise giving resources and money and respect. So yeah. yeah, Sue, and you had something to add about the prefiguring the welfare state thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in the time that I was born because I was born, uh, born 10 years after this was written, 1948 and into the welfare state. I mean, you know, 1948 um, compulsory education to the age of 16, um, reconstruction of housing, social housing, grant aid for education. So I was a grant aided grammar school girl, grant aided to go through college, um, lived in a really good council house. So benefited from the welfare state. And these ideas were very much prefigured by her. She's saying, as it's not in this quotation, but in another, let's give an income and a living, a prospect of a decent life to everybody to all the reproductive class, or the, whole, the whole female class. And then let's see what happens to your ideas of war and your ideas of what, what's the good in society. Um, and that sort of promise was sort of slightly fulfilled and to some extent fulfilled, and then obviously betrayed by Thatcher, um, this idea that you could construct a world where um, the reproduction of children and the upbringing of children was protected by the state. Um, yeah, and, it's, and, and it's, I think it's, go, it it's going in, fast, and we're we're getting this whole new hyper idea of what this what the what society is. It's kind of three yeah. billionaires, three billionaires in a spaceship reproducing themselves, becoming transhuman, and the rest of us becoming more and more enslaved. So uh, Sue mentioned when I was talking about this before that there's a fine and deep split in radical feminism between uh, on this view about sort of wages for motherhood or uh, sort of political lesbianism and not not being mothers. And um, so I think that's an area that she's she's sort of touching on the problem and she's got a solution. 
Um, I mean, so uh, anyway, that's we're just mentioning she talks about this yeah. now. Yeah. Um, oh, before we go to this, actually, I just want to say there's another one thing that um, uh, is. Uh, no, I can't find it. Um, uh, OK, let's. Oh, yes, yes. So really interesting thing she says is that she does a big analogy to if there is a spotlight on the road and you're a rabbit and you become dazzled by the spotlight you can't solve the problem and you just stay there transfixed mm. by the light and then you get run over um she says that we as in the society of outsiders we women should get out of the spotlight and do our work in secret and out dark. of the light in the darkness and it's that's yeah. so interesting that sort of yeah. all the stuff that's going on at this if you watch the mainstream media you get caught up in the spotlight and you can't yeah. see anything else and our work can't be done in the spotlight yeah. uh, so that's just amazing that she says that yeah, okay final slide so so in our opinion, well, I don't, I think Sue agrees with this. I certainly think this is a radical feminist text and it doesn't, it, because of the reasons we've said, but it doesn't cover some of the radical feminist work. So it doesn't cover political lesbianism, doesn't cover sexuality. And then uh, Sue, if you want to go on the other couple that it, we think it doesn't cover. Yeah, it doesn't, um, she doesn't actually describe rape um, one thought that Jo had when we were early on in our discussions was that she she kind of alludes to the the, the feelings that um, survivors have with this idea that there's this smell, there's this odor, there's this hint uh, when you when you're in the company of men that rape can happen, has happened, but that's only an in, in something an inference, not not mm. it's not actually there in the text. She doesn't look at physical violence. She doesn't deconstruct the sexism of law, and she doesn't allude to pornography. But, yeah, I mean, she yeah, does. Yeah, those are the things that she doesn't look at, and That's she's on her time. Yeah, she she does say that if you, as a woman, marry a uh, like a Frenchman, you become French. So she that's a legal aspect, I think. But she doesn't really deconstruct it, no, does she? No, uh, mostly, no. not to the yeah. extent that we've been able to in the 21st century so. yeah and then uh the other thing is as well as analysis and these suggested actions three guineas gives us a clear insight into 1930s england and it acts as a bridge between the first wave suffragettes of the 19th century and the early 20th centuries and the second wave feminists in whenever 70s and 80s and so it, it, just to see that bridge is amazing as well. And it's also beautiful and inspiring. And that when you read it, you're participating. It sparks loads of ideas. And I would suggest it's best read in conjunction with Mary Daly's Gynecology and Pure Lust. That's what made me so unbelievably excited about uh, this, uh, Three Guineas. I sort of got it more by reading it with Mary Daly's work. But um, I, you know, I, I'm sure it's it, it's fantastic to read it on its own as well. Yeah, it's kind of really helped me be a writer. I don't have definitely a high opinion of myself as a writer, but I definitely see myself as a writer, and this has been almost my creative writing primer. It's fantastic, and for all of that, it's uh, it's worth worth a good read. Yeah, brilliant. Well. Um, Thank you so much for being here. Uh, for all the women who were in the chat, um, unfortunately, I didn't read any of the chats. Um, that was good. Gonna, that, was, that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah I'm going to read it now. Okay. I think these radical feminist perspectives often work on lots of different layers and the chat can be, um, you know, just better or, or as good or going deeper into this. Uh, but we've created a space where we can we can be together and um and continue thinking about this so um i'm going to read the chat afterwards sorry we we haven't if there were any questions then um uh uh i'll uh, well i don't know don't know how to answer them but anyway never mind thank you so <laughs> much everybody thank you sue it's been massive thank pleasure thanks, yeah, thanks for the privilege we've got um another round we've got two weeks off now um 
from radical feminist perspectives. And then on in, I think it's the 9th of January, we're going to have Sheila Jeffries and it's been put in the chat uh, what the topic is. So, um, and we'll also send you an email. Uh, if you're registered for this, you can use the same link for the Sheila Jeffries and somebody else doing something. Okay, <laughs> have a good <laughs> Christmas or festive periods. Have a nice festive period. And bye, bye. Thank you, Joe. Bye. bye.